Hello, and welcome to the Doug Adams Gallery. My name is Elizabeth Pena, and as the director of the Center for the Arts and Religion here at the Graduate Theological Union, it's my pleasure to welcome you this morning to the Doug Adams Gallery. We're in the last couple of days of our exhibition, Reverberating Echoes, and it's a really great time for us to reflect on everything this exhibition has brought us. The day that we opened the exhibition was the very day that President Trump signed the so-called Muslim ban, and this exhibit turned out to be very timely and very um, meaningful to all of us here at the Graduate Theological Union. And we were very pleased to be presenting this exhibition in partnership with our colleagues from the Center for Islamic Studies here at the GTU. Uh, throughout the couple of months that the exhibition has been up, we have conducted nine public programs. We have welcomed over 900 visitors, which is a record for us. And we have all really benefited from discussions and exchanges that have gone on uh, during, this, during this period. We've produced a beautiful catalog, which you can actually purchase from our colleagues at Zaytuna College. Special guest lecture from our Dillenberger Lecture Series in Art History. And the topic of that lecture was going to be about a connection between Christian art and Islamic art. And that led me to start thinking about, wouldn't it be great to do an exhibition about contemporary Islamic art that kind of showed people where uh, art that was inspired by uh, the Islamic tradition, by the Islamic visual heritage, where that was today. And because I would not know how to do that myself, I reached out to our expert here at the Graduate Theological Union, Carol Beer, to see if she would be willing to curate <clears throat> an exhibition that kind of introduced our community to people thinking about traditional Islamic uh, visual tradition. And she agreed to do that. And so that's how we ended up with this great exhibition. And now I'd like to introduce you to our colleague, Carol Beer, who did a fabulous job. And we were so grateful that she took on this challenge of creating this exhibition for us. It's been a pleasure to be affiliated with Carol for these months. We've really enjoyed every minute. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you, Elizabeth. <laughs> It's been a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for me, and unexpectedly I found I brought to bear all of my work on traditional Islamic art and actually articulated a definition of it in the catalog that brings to the fore my vision of an algorithmic aesthetic of pattern that underlies arabesques and calligraphy and geometric patterns. And I hope it will be an exhibition whose meaning lives on beyond the time of the exhibition. I'm sure it will. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the exhibition Reverberating Echoes, Contemporary Art Inspired by Traditional Islamic Art. I'm Carol Beer, curator. My position here at the Graduate Theological Union is as visiting scholar with the Center for Islamic Studies. By profession, I'm a historian of Islamic art, and I served as curator at the Textile Museum in Washington, D.C. for several decades. And I've been here in the Bay Area for the last 10 years, and I'm just delighted to be able to introduce this exhibition to you today. My vision as curator is that the visitor walks up to these glass doors and sees the garden behind me, Hanging Vines and Flowers, by Nazanin Hedayat Munro, and sees the exhibition first through these vines and flowers, and then walks across the gallery to the first object in the exhibition, Steps and Shadows, by Mamun Sakal. Before I begin with an explanation of Mamun's work, I'd like to mention that the exhibition highlights the work of seven American artists. Being a Muslim was not a criterion for selection in the exhibition, and both Muslims and non-Muslims are represented among the works selected for display. The first is Mamun Sakal, who is an, trained as an architect, now works as a typography specialist, and his works are represented by five digital works that are archivally printed on canvas. Next to his are the works of Chris Palmer, who is an artist who works in textile and paper medium. There's also work in wood and uh, crystal wrapped in paper. 
and following him is uh, Phil Webster, who's trained in mathematics and cognitive sciences and has a work works in a variety of media. Then coming around the other side of the gallery is Nathan Voiro, who is a, a graduate of Rhode Island School of Design. And he works in three media represented in the exhibition, ceramics, jacquard woven textile, and works on paper. His works are followed by three of Manzar Rasuli, who is an artist based in Baltimore, Maryland, um, trained in the visual arts. And she has several works with figural imagery and one which rejects tradition entirely. And the final artist in the exhibition is Nazanin Hedaya Munro, who is a specialist in textile installations. And she has both the uh, handmade vines and flowers, which we've seen previously, and um, an installation of 100 Destinies with Sarnavest written on the vest of the garment. And we saw that with the introduction with Dr. Elizabeth Pena. This is a work by Mamun Sakal. It's called Steps and Shadows Wide 2. It was created in 2014. What's interesting about Mamun Sakal's works is they are digital, digital art. So only exist in cyberspace, in virtual reality. And we needed to specify that we wanted them printed on canvas, an archival digital print on a wooden stretcher to size specifications for the gallery. He works in an unusual manner as a graphic artist in the digital um, arts because he's not working in the same idiom as an artist in the art market. And he is working in a globalized world. All of his works are available on the internet um, through his website, through Fine Arts America. And you can specify whether you want a pillow or a t-shirt or a digital print, as we've specified. In this particular instance, he's working with a grid where you see intersecting axes. And what, for me, as an art historian of Islamic art, is very interesting. He is creating an illusion of three-dimensional space in two dimensions. But he's doing it not through the Western standard of linear perspective, but rather through the use of line, color, and intersection of lines. So there is a brick, if you will. And each brick that is repeated and reflected carries on it Arabic calligraphy in a form of square Kufic that reads, there is no God but God with the name of God highlighted in yellow. And intersecting with that, the second line of the Islamic creed, Muhammad is his messenger. So each of the letters coming down in this plane intersect with each of the letters in these two intersecting planes. It's just an absolutely brilliant design. And then you can see it's reflected along the various axes throughout the work. Another of the archival digital prints of Mamun Sakal is a documentary photograph looking up into the arch of a monument in Bukhara, the Aziz Khan Madrasa, and looking at a structure called Mukarnas, which is the internal segmentation of the vault. And he's taken this documentary photograph and then manipulated it digitally and created from it a work of art. In this work, Mamun Sakal has utilized the calligraphic typography of um, a friend of his, Jamal Bustani, and created uh, a font that's called Bustani that he and his daughter worked out to program so that proportionality allows it to be increased and decreased in size 
using digital manipulation. Arabic calligraphy lends itself beautifully to that kind of digital manipulation, and this has become a, special, a specialty of Mamun Sakal, who is an Arabic typography specialist for Microsoft. The inscription highlights two words, al-manfa al-watan, and the text itself is from um, Nairiz Malik, a contemporary Syrian author, that exile can substitute for killing, but it cannot substitute for homeland. So a very, very poignant message in today's world. And if you look closely, the diacritic marks that establish the sound of each letter form, the same form can have different sounds depending on the number of marks on it. Here is a B and a Y with the same letter and an F and a Q, the same letter with the drops of blood that Mamun has created to mark the different letter forms. Samarkand and its architectural monuments with calligraphic inscriptions in glazed ceramic tile is the inspiration for this work which is called Salam Peace, based on its inscriptions. There are actually three layers of Arabic inscriptions here that are defined by two overlapping square grids, so that you have squares on points and squares on base, and working together with different layers of calligraphy. The largest inscription comes around in white squares on point, in a spiral arrangement and states that a Muslim is one who does not harm another Muslim by hand or by tongue. And the other two layers of inscription are Salam, Peace, and Islam, the name of the religion. This lyrical representation of a bird is executed in Arabic calligraphy in two words that read Salam, forming the wings, and hub, forming the body of the bird and its head, with the letter B highlighted by the dot beneath it. And without calligraphic significance, the dot of the eye of the bird, al-ayn. Mamun Sakal, the digital artist who created this work, has based this calligraphy on an Ottoman script, the Divani. We shift now to the work of Chris Palmer, who is the manager of the Digital Fabrication Lab for students in architecture at University of California, Berkeley, just a few blocks away. That's his day job, and in his free time, he is an artist who is recognized around the world for his work that combines traditions of Japanese origami with Islamic tiling and architectural forms. In this instance, there's a three-dimensional Mukarna structure, which although it looks curved, is en entirely um, composed of flat pieces of birch wood that have been cut and shaped and interlaced, interlaced in what he calls a finger panel system, such that the entire structure of the Mukarna, the segmentation of a squinch vault, is constructed of flat pieces, no curvature, and without um, adhesives or nails. Constructed in Baghdad in the 11th century, and it very soon was um, repeated all the way across the Islamic world from Spain to India. This is an example of what one looked like, but the construction is different from the 11th century. And earlier on this tour of the exhibition, we saw a 17th century example in the Bukhara Mukarnas looking up into the vault in the work of Mamun Sakal, a digitally manipulated photograph. Here we have an actual three-dimensional example of this form of Mukarnas, which is a particular Arab contribution to architectural form. Chris Palmer's recent work treats of fabric which he folds and folds and folds and folds 
to create geometric patterns that are closely related to traditional Islamic tilings. In this instance, there is a hexagonal grid, that's a hexagon with six angles, and it extends off into infinity. In the center of each hexagon is a 12-pointed star, and each of the 12-pointed stars is different in each hexagon. And at each of the angles of intersection on the grid is a six-pointed star, also each one of which is different, each affected only by folds and with no cutting and no sewing. So this is one piece of silk fabric which he has worked and worked by hand and with some ironing, but it's entirely without sewing or cutting and piecing. Another of Chris's shadow fold works plays with light as a medium. Each of his shadow folds works plays with light as a medium. And that is daylight comes through and is caught in the folds. And where one fold is more than a single fold, it's darker. And where it's a single fold, it's lighter. So part of that is playing with light as a medium in creation of these geometric grids. Another example of shadow folds by Chris Palmer is one in which there are six-fold symmetries, four-fold symmetries, and three-fold symmetries, which have a mechanical analog in that if you turned one, all of the gears would turn. So this work not only plays with light as a medium, but it also brings us to recall the works of Ibn al-Haytham, one of the great Islamic scientists in the early period of um, Islamic civilization, who worked both with optics and mechanics. Here we see a crystal dodecahedron, that is a 12-sided polyhedron, each face a regular pentagon. And Chris has worked out a polar net folding of paper so that by manipulating the paper around the dodecahedron, he is able to entirely wrap it in the, what he calls a poly patch. A dodecahedron is a, what we call a platonic solid. And it was Plato's works that described these polyhedra that were translated into Arabic and Persian early in the period of Islamic civilization. And they were treated then by mathematicians and considered in the textual tradition of Islam. This is a sculptural pairing by Phil Webster, an infinite fractal star and flower. The inverse sculptural relationship is that in one case, an eightfold traditional Islamic tiling is inflated and the other deflated, playing with the infinite and the infinitesimal. The visual relationship to a star and a flower reminds us of the innate power of geometry, that structures are universe. That was long a concern of both philosophers and traditional Islamic craftsmen, and often expressed in Islamic geometric ornament. This work by Phil Webster is a screened icosahedron. An icosahedron is a polyhedron of 20 faces, each face an equilateral triangle. So equal faces, equal edges, equal angles is what characterize what we call the platonic solids. There are only five of them. The um, tetrahedron, the cube, the octahedron, the dodecahedron, and the icosahedron. Inside this icosahedron, which is 3D printed, he has placed LED lights that project lights and shadows into this little niche that we've built in the gallery. And again, Phil is playing here, as we saw with Chris Palmer earlier, with light as a medium, in this case projection and shadows. So he too is referring back to both platonic solids that were treated and translated in Islamic textual tradition from the 10th century onwards, and light as a medium that was explored by Ibn al-Haytham in his study of optics, um, Kitab al-Manazir. 
In this work of Infinity Flower 4, Phil Webster has taken a traditional tenfold Islamic tiling, that is a ten-pointed star within a ten-pointed star with ten radiating petals, and iterated it with a fractal dimension so with self-similarity to a vanishing point in one direction and to an infinite perimeter in the other direction. So he's playing both with the infinitesimal and the infinite. The work is executed digitally, but then constructed with a dye sublimation print in aluminum. This is a technology developed in the middle of the 20th century, which heat transfer enables the dye to um, fuse with the aluminum substratum. These are eight architectural studies by Human Koliji, an architect who was trained in Iran, and then subsequently um, came to the United States and received his doctorate in architectural theory from Virginia Technical University. He begins with the notion that our gaze is limited by floors, walls, and ceilings. But orosi, an architectural feature of a window in Persian garden pavilions that has a geometric structure, gives us a vision and an opening of our gaze to the universe and the cosmos. Three examples of his architectural studies that explore the phenomenon of light through an orosi in a garden pavilion explore the Orosi with its geometric structure and light projected through it. it. It's not the spectrum, but projected through stained glass pieces that are set in the geometric framework. And they're set in a traditional garden, in a pavilion, an architectural pavilion, in a traditional Persian garden, with its rows of cypress trees and its alleys and its channels of water. A third of his architectural studies conceptualizes the cypress tree and how it blocks the light from being received through the Orosi. Human's vision of his architectural studies is that they are different in some way than in the Western tradition, where an architectural drawing is a stop on a trajectory from conception and design to construction. In the case of Human working in a Persian philosophical tradition, there is a realm of imagination, an imaginal reality, that allows for the conceptualization of different ways of looking at what's happening in an architectural context. So for example, he's looking at the falling of shadows or the projection of light through stained glass or the bending of rays of light or the projection of light. And each of these is approached through his architectural studies. Another architectural study by Human Koliji explores the possibility of geometry. Here he's articulated multiple levels based on a digital reproduction of a 15th century architectural scroll in Topkapi Palace, Istanbul that we think dates from about the 15th century and the Timurid realm. And he's articulated the geometry within it, bringing out circles and centers and polygons, creating polygonal networks, indicating some, just some, of the possibilities that are inherent. Nathan Voirol is an artist who's based in Brooklyn, New York, and he works in many different media. And here we see a ceramic tile based on traditional Islamic tilings, ceramic tilings, with an 18-pointed star in the center and a portion of a 12-pointed star, a third of a 12-pointed star, at each of the angles of the hexagon. So if this ceramic molded piece were recreated, 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 it would cover the whole plane of the wall with a hexagonal grid with 18-pointed stars and 12-pointed stars. These are two of Nathan Voirol's jacquard weave textiles. One is in the traditional pattern of an Indo-Persian carpet, but rendered in a woven textile. 
an Indo-Persian floral pattern. If you come up close, you can see the texture of the weave all on the surface, but warps and wefts interlacing behind the surface so that each of the colors is carried within the fabric. This is an automated computerized jacquard loom, 19th century, maybe even late 18th century technology, but with a traditional Islamic pattern um, programmed into the weave. And this particular um, design was based on an ink drawing that Nathan made. He had been an intern at the OBT rug factory in Varanasi, India, and that's where he learned particularly his work with these patterns. Nathan also has worked in a geometric um, concept of design, and in this case it's a computer-aided drawing that he has then programmed in the jacquard weave. It has seven-fold symmetry within the pattern. These are both prototypes, and his hope is that he will get commissions and be able to develop a home line furnishing. Nathan also works with um, arabesque designs, and I've selected to include one of his unfinished works, just a sketch of an arabesque, where you can actually see the underlying geometry of two squares divided, divided, and divided. And that serves as a basis for his hand drawing of the arabesque pattern. He then, in his process of work, takes that base pattern and uses it for tracing an arabesque in opaque watercolor and a gold marker and does it in a variety of different uh, forms and manners that are inspired by traditional Arab, Islamic arabesques. And here we have one finished arabesque medallion of opaque watercolors, ink, and gold on uh, vellum, a high quality paper. And that is one of his finished works, but you can see it has an underlying structure of geometry of the arabesque, as well as the formal um, stylization of the vegetal leaves and flowers. Installation in textile silk, serge silk, uh, by Nazanin Hedaya Munro. It's handmade vines and flowers, and perhaps you can see it gently moving in the breeze. Um, it's a component of a much larger work that we didn't have room in the exhibition to display called The Mystics Have Fled the Garden. And what it represents is her response to a travel back to Iran. She herself was born in Detroit, Michigan, but of Persian ancestry. And the, her first trip, she found magnificent Persian gardens in and around Tehran. But when she went back as a teenager, the gardens were no longer there. The areas had been developed. And so this was her response, creating the garden of her dreams, the garden of her desires, and an expression of longing and loss for her cultural heritage. This textile installation by Nazanin Hedayat Munro is called 100 Destinies. Destiny in Persian is the word sarnavesht, which means written on the forehead, literally written on the forehead. And she has designed the gown and the vest, and with her father's help added the Persian calligraphy, Persian written in Arabic script. And the word sarnavesht is repeated throughout the garment. The concept of a hundred destinies, the concept of destiny, is one that here is explained through a traditional practice of bibliomancy, which is still practiced in Nazanin's family and um, by her ancestors in Tehran. She has connected the dress by 100 threads to 100 dots of blood each of which is positioned on a ghazal of Hafez every day over a hundred days of his ghazaliyat, his book of ghazals, Persian poems, asking a question having to do with her future. How could his poems foretell her future? Now, he lived in the 14th century, died, I think it was 1389, 
But here she is referring to his poetry and asking a question. And for each answer, the key word is highlighted with a drop of blood. And each drop of blood is connected to the woman's body that is conceptually her own. This is the work of Manzar Rasuli, an artist who lives in Baltimore, Maryland. And at first glance, this portrait may look like something strongly influenced by Matisse. But it is a representation of Manzar's daughter, Leda. It's called Leda. It's part of a series called Women of Persia. And it's Leda seated in her house with her Persian textiles and colors and decorative uh, decorative designs and patterns and Persian garments. It, this is actually a no ruse costume that Leda was going to wear to school that day. But Manzar's point is to demonstrate not so much an influence of Matisse as sources of Matisse's paintings. So the tabouret, the table, the legs, the couch, the divan, the flowers, the rug, the textiles on the wall, are all expressive of her cultural heritage in Iran and how much that influenced, um, along with scenes from North Africa, how much that influenced the works of Matisse in the 19th century. A later series of Manzar's work the earlier one was in the 1990s. This next series, Women West, Women East for Global Peace, is a series that she painted um, and executed as collages after September 11, 2001. And it addresses her concerns for women and what women have experienced and how traumatic is our world, and yet there's still hope. And she's included in it not just the faces of women, some veiled, some not veiled, and some traditional decorative Persian fabrics, but also a bird and a traditional musical instrument. The style of this work, as you may recognize, is much more closely related to Western traditions of painting and very expressive of emotion and atmospheric in its presentation. The third series of work of Manzar Rasuli, as represented in this exhibition, is one that she's currently engaged with, and that is Conversations with Silence. This work was actually executed while we were preparing and planning for the exhibition. It's expressive of a rejection of tradition. She places the canvas on a surface in front of her, and with one movement of the palette knife and the modeling paste, gesso, she creates the work. But it is very much a rejection of all that has proceeded. It's the final work in the exhibition. And for me, it's a sharp juxtaposition between conversations with silence and the work of Mamun Sakal, which is so closely tied to the Islamic creed and the tradition of there is no God but God. Muhammad is his messenger. In closing, I'd like to thank you for walking through the exhibition with me and enjoying considerations of these seven American artists whose art is so intimately connected with an engagement with tradition, and in particular, engagement with traditional Islamic art, whether it be in calligraphy, figural representation, architectural forms, geometric patterns, or arabesques. And what I've tried to demonstrate is that in each of these different media and different ways of making meaning through art, there is both an engagement with tradition, an engagement with technology, and an exploration of meaning.